Okay, we are beginning the second review for the unit on cell membranes and movement across the membranes. Uh, first image here, fluid mosaic model. I think it sums up the entire beginning of chapter eight, uh, talking about what makes up a cell membrane and how that governs how the cell is going to work. Uh, so this image is probably going to be on your test or something very similar to this, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, make sure you know it. Uh, the big thing is that you understand when you look at this that there's multiple different things that are contributing to how this uh, cell is going to behave. So one of the big things is this protein right here, oh, this protein right here is a transmembrane protein or an integral protein. Uh, and that integral protein is very unique in that it has uh, amphipathic um, properties. The outer part of this integral protein out here, or the outer part that's on the inside of the cell, is going to have to be hydrophilic, whereas this part on the interior of the cell membrane is going to have to be hydrophobic. Uh, so it's very amphipathic on the outside. Now, it is a integral protein, so it's going to be letting things through that can't normally get through. So charged particles, uh, large molecules, uh, things of that nature. Things that can move through the membrane easily without this integral protein would be small, nonpolar uh, things like gases like O2 or CO2 or N2, whatever the case may be, where there's really no charge to them and they're small enough that they can freely diffuse across that membrane. If we're using something like glucose, glucose is a big enough molecule that it's going to have to have some sort of integral protein to move through. So this integral protein that we're looking at, uh, amphipathic on the outside, but if we were to move something like glucose that can readily dissolve in water, we're going to have to have a channel that's kind of bored through the center of this. And as you go through that channel, uh, it needs to have the same type of property that that molecule has. So if it was a glucose molecule, we want, probably want something that's very polar on the inside. If it was water, we want something that's very polar. If we're trying to move a lipid um, that we'll talk about when we get to digestion, the, the molecules get uh, to the point where it's broken up into smaller little globules, we'd want the inside of that protein to have a nonpolar type of tube going through the center. Um, the other type of protein that you see in membranes is the peripheral proteins, which you see here, peripheral meaning outsides. Uh, so you see this on the outside of the cell membrane. doesn't really go through. This is going to be for anchoring and whatnot. If you do see them on the inside, you see that it's connecting to cytoskeleton components. That's going to allow for uh, the cell to be much more uh, dynamic but yet still stable so it still has some support if you see proteins on the outside chances are they're going to be connected to some sort of carbohydrate like you see here the glycoprotein where we have a peripheral protein that's connected to a chain of carbohydrates and that's going to be used for tagging so any of the other uh, outside of the cell carbohydrates that you see like glycolipids and glycoproteins, and then this one is not labeled. This would be an oligosaccharide. Uh, it's just connected to the cell membrane, kind of wedged into that hydrophilic section of the cell membrane. Um, the other things that you see on this diagram that are important, obviously the phospholipid bilayer. You have to understand that the interior of that cell membrane is nonpolar, whereas the outside is hydrophilic uh, and it is polar. And you can see the last piece then is the uh, cholesterol molecules right here that we talked about when we were doing organic molecules. You've got four fused rings there, steroid type of molecule. And this is going to act as like an antifreeze to the cell membrane. So uh, organisms that live in very cold environments are going to have to have cell membranes that have much more cholesterol in their cells. All right, so that is the makeup of the cell membrane. The reason it's called fluid mosaic fluid because it's moving or it's floating. Uh, mosaic because it has lots of different pieces that connect to its overall shape. Um, yeah, I think that's good enough. Next image, we're talking finally about how things are moving across the membrane. So what you're seeing is uh, passive transport versus active transport. Big thing is passive, meaning no energy required. So we're following with that for, or the second law of thermodynamics where we're going to be moving from high to low. 
very easily there's no energy required. So diffusion is just the molecules moving freely across the membrane with no help whatsoever. Um, things like the gases that we were talking about, diffusion even happens without membranes, keep that in mind, where if you take a little bit of dye and you drop it into the top of a water, it will finally spread out. When you come back an hour or two later, the whole beaker will look uh, the same color or farts, of course, are a good example of diffusion. Uh, comes out of one spot and then eventually spreads across the room. Everybody smells the uh, rank that may have been uh, let go, right? He who smelt it, dealt it, and he who de denied it, applied it. Uh, but all that is diffusion. If we have molecules that need to move from high to low but still have an issue getting through that cell membrane, then we have to have facilitated diffusion where we have that integral protein Roll integral, if that, you can see what that says. Uh, integral protein that's going to facilitate the diffusion of those molecules across the membrane, still going from high to low. Um, and the last piece is then active transport. We're going to have to use some sort of energy, ATP, to allow those molecules to move. Now we're going actively, so we're going from low to high. We're, we're going against the concentration gradient. Remember, concentration gradient just means that there's a difference from one side to the other. So if you have uh, a small amount on one side and a higher amount on the other, we'll talk about when we get to osmosis slide, um, you, you're looking at how that movement or that difference can actually do work for us eventually. All right, next picture is showing you uh, how we move larger particles. Uh, this is going to take ATP to do this because we're moving a small or a large amount of stuff uh, at one time. In all three of these images, we're pulling things into the cell. So you're seeing endocytosis. Right? Endo meaning entering the cell. So the first one, phagocytosis, we're pulling in food particles, right? Much like a white blood cell uh, or a bacteria would eat, but a white blood cell would eat the bacteria. So this is how your immune system works. The large white blood cells that we'll talk about later in the year are going to consume bacteria. So it would, this would be a bacteria. And the white blood cell would engulf and take in that bacteria. And then we'd have a lysosome that would fuse together with that bacteria-filled um, vesicle, that vacuole, and then digest that bacteria so that we can present it as an antigen-presenting cell and continue the immune system response. Um, pinocytosis, we're pulling in water molecules and uh, ions that may be need, needed for that organism. So, for example, this would be how a uh, paramecium or a stentor or a volvox or things like that would eat uh, in their aquatic environment. And then the last one is just showing how uh, receptors can help out with a uh, incorporation of different types of molecules so that it's not just so blindly taking things in. Um, if things bind to it because they're present in the vicinity, we can actually take in things to the cell. But regardless, all three of these are images of endocytosis, where we're going to have to use some sort of ATP to do it. This one's showing you the opposite of endocytosis, which is exocytosis. Once again, we need ATP to do this. Um, this one is actually showing, if you've seen a thing in psychology class or heard uh, your teacher talking about this. This is the end of a neuron. We'll come back to this when we get to the human body systems. This is how one neuron talks to the other. So what you're seeing here is one neuron talking to another neuron. And the space between is called the synaptic cleft. And so we have an electrical signal that comes down this neuron, but it's not electrical from neuron 1 to neuron 2. It's actually chemical. So once the electrical signal gets to the end of the axon here, um, it causes a chemical chain reaction which will allow for calcium to bind up to different uh, products that are being made. And the neurotransmitters then are pushed out into this synaptic cleft, as you can see here. They'll bind up with the postsynaptic cleft receptors and allow things to enter the cell, usually depolarizing that second cell, allowing for the electrical signal to continue. So I know what you're thinking. 
We've talked passive transport, we've talked active transport, but we haven't talked about one of the big things that's connected with your lab. You want osmosis? You got osmosis. No, actually, that white blood cell of this cartoon is uh, shows very little to anything to do with the process of, of osmosis. Sorry, but it is a good cartoon. I highly suggest renting it if you want. Bill Murray's in it. Bill Murray's awesome. All right, so osmosis is the uh, basically diffusion of water, right? So we are simply talking about how water moves only. Yet we get a lot of designations that go with this, uh, and it can be confusing if you're not paying attention. So hypertonic and hypotonic are two words that are associated with diffusion, and then the last one be isotonic. So you're looking at the YouTube, the original YouTube, not the YouTube that has viral videos. This is a U-shaped tube. And in the center of the YouTube, we have a selectively permeable membrane. That selectively permeable membrane is not letting through, I don't know what color this is, crimson, something of that nature, um, molecules. So they cannot pass through, so they're stuck where they are. Um, and we see the designation hypo and hyper. Well, hyper means that there's more stuff. And when I say stuff, I mean not water, right? So we have more stuff in that side, less stuff on this side. So if there's less stuff over here, there's actually more water available, even though these are at the same level. This one has less water, the right-hand side. The right-hand side has less water available. Hence, we see water moving from high to low. Well, that's actually water moving from hypo to hyper. That's the confusing part, because you're thinking hyper is high and hypo being low, that it would be going from hyper to hypo, but it is not. It's going hypo to hyper. Um, the thing that I have said in class uh, is that water is... You know, we talked about how it's kind of a, a unique molecule, right? And that it tends to be kind of kinky. It likes to talk and whisper sweet nothings into each other's ears as a hydrogen bond, right? So we got the face of Mickey Mouse here. This is crude. No, it looks like a bear more than anything. It is talking into the ear of another one. But water is also a party animal. It likes to go where the party is. So there's very little party over here, right? We have less molecules. So water will go to where there's more stuff going on. So hence you see the water moves from the left-hand side to the right-hand side or the hypo side to the hyper. Now, if we were to do a chemical analysis of this, even though the water level's here and the water level's here on this right-hand side, we would say that they're pretty much at isotonic now. They've reached a chemical equilibrium. Well, once things reach equilibrium, they do not stop. So Water is constantly going to be kind of moving back and forth, but keeping at that isotonic concentration once we reach that point. So that being said, we need to kind of talk about how this applies to real living cells. So here we're showing an animal cell. Um, you do have to know how an animal cell and a plant cell differ in their natural state. Uh, so what you're looking at in the first image is a red blood cell, real picture, red blood cell. Um, and a real red blood cell likes to be an isotonic medium, meaning the outside of the cell uh, and the inside of the cell are at the same solute balance so that water is equally exchanging. Uh, this is the idea behind taking in electrolyte solutions um, when you're doing any sort of aerobic activity. So if you're running or you're biking or you're doing some activity where you're uh, working out for more than a half an hour, you should probably have something like a Gatorade or... Um, if you're really cheap, you could just have some water with some sugar and some salt in it, and that's basically the same thing. Uh, but you're balancing out that so that your water can re replace the lost amount during your evaporative cooling. The second picture is showing hypertonic medium, so we're saying something that's incredibly salty. right? Remember, water follows the party, so water wants to come out to where all the salt is, and then it'll crinate your cells, they'll shrivel up and uh, it makes it worse. So if you're out in the middle of the ocean, you're dying of thirst, the worst thing you could do is probably take a drink of water uh, from the ocean because that's really salty water. It's going to dehydrate your cells even more. Um, taking that effect, you rescue somebody that has been incredibly dehydrated, and you think that the best way to get the water in, knowing your biology, is to give them pure water. So instead of making them drink it, you want to 
hydrate them really fast, and you decide to shoot distilled water into their veins, well, distilled water is 0% solute, so the party is actually on the inside of the cells, and the water will rush into the point where it will swell, and if they're unlucky, <laughs> those cells will explode, they'll lice. Um, the opposite is, in a plant cell, a plant cell loves this type of medium. It likes incredibly pure water. And the reason that they don't explode is because they have cell walls to push back. So uh, a normal plant cell would want to be in a hypotonic medium, not a hypertonic or an isotonic. Because in an isotonic, the plant kind of wilts over. So it likes something like pure tap water or distilled water to be poured on them so that they can hydrate those cells really well. Okay, sample problems. So here's a sample problem. If you want to pause this and see if you can figure out which way the water is going to move and give explanation and application of vocab, that would be great. Okay, so the answers for this one, we have a bag here that has sucrose, and sucrose cannot move through. I should have wrote that at the beginning, but I didn't. All right, so which way would the water move? Well, since there's more sucrose on the outside of the cell here, water is going to move out of the bag, and the bag will lose water. Right? And so the outside was hyper, and the inside was hypo. So water will move from hypo to hyper. Okay, so a simpler problem. Things that you might see on the test would be something like this, where we have a dual. Uh, solute concentration that we're looking at. So we have this cell here. Um, I don't know. He, he looks happy or sad, so we'll give him a little smile here. Maybe he'll stick his tongue out because he doesn't think you can answer this problem. Um, so the membrane does not let starch through, but glucose can get through. So the first thing I want you to be able to do is, can you label uh, what the inside of the cell is compared to the outside of the cell? And then the second part is, can you explain what's going to happen as far as osmosis and even more importantly what's going to happen to uh, this chap here that you see. So go ahead and pause it and see if you can answer the question and then when you answer the question um, you'll come back and press play and I will explain it to you. Alright, so the cell right now uh, is in water but the water has a 35 percent glucose and a 15 percent starch and inside the cell it's 10 percent glucose and 30 percent starch. Well, altogether, we would add up the solute here. This one's 40. And if we add up this one, altogether, this one's 50. So even though starch isn't moving, which is super important for us to understand when we're doing osmosis, right now, the outside is hyper and the inside is hypo. I know it makes very little sense because the glucose is actually going to be moving. So now glucose starts moving. Starch can't. So glucose will balance itself out via diffusion, right? So glucose, it doesn't matter, balances itself out. So uh, 45, half of 45, what are we looking at? 22.5, right? So eventually glucose is 22.5% in both spots. Now starch can't move, so now water has to work to balance that out. So since there's more starch on the inside of the cell than there is outside of the cell, we would now say that the outside of the cell overall would be hypo and the inside of the cell would be hyper. So water actually starts rushing into the cell and this individual is going to expand and possibly explode. Uh, if you have more questions on these types of problems, feel, please feel free to contact your teacher. I'm sure uh, he or she, depending on when it is throughout the years of teaching AP Bio, We'll have some of those examples. I know that the Chapter 8 practice quizzes that are given out um, have a couple of these problems as well, but guaranteed that you will see this on both the um, real test, on the AP test, and your final exam. Thanks again, and we'll talk later.